You're listening to Melissa and Lori Love Literacy. In this series, we've been exploring parts of Scarborough's reading rope, Beyond Phonics. Today, we're going to connect all of the parts of the rope to comprehension with Doug Fisher. You might think that comprehension is a skill to practice when really it's an outcome. Welcome, teacher friend. I'm Lori. And I'm Melissa. We are two literacy educators in Baltimore. We want the best for all kids, and we know you do too. Our district recently adopted a new literacy curriculum, which meant a lot of change for everyone. Lori and I can't wait to keep learning about literacy with you today. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Melissa and Lori Love Literacy. Today, we are here with a legendary guest. Yeah, we're here with Doug Fisher today, who is a professor at San Diego State University, and I'm sure many of you know the author of I don't know a million books. Is mm. it? <laughs> do you have any? Give him a Doug? lot of credit. Do you know, do you know uh, how many I, books you've written? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Welcome to the podcast, Doug. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah. Well, I feel like you've you've seemingly and probably actually have, but studied literally every topic in education for, I don't even know how long, um, you could, you could probably tell us that, but, um, I don't know if you remember this moment in time, Melissa's going to share more, uh, but you ran into her at a conference about 10 years ago, or I probably should say she ran into you or maybe found you. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I am sure you do not remember this, but it is like a highlight of, of my education career was, it was 10 years ago. So I was, I was a younger teacher and I had, I'm sure read one of your books at the time and saw you at the conference and, and we, we found you, (laughs) a bunch of friends and I, we found you and we were really, really excited to ask you like a burning question. And we wanted to know what you were going to say. So we actually asked you like, what do you think is going to be the biggest shift in reading instruction um, in the next like 10 years? What do you think is going to change? Um, and you told us at the time it was about text leveling and that we shouldn't be necessarily leveling by like the letters, you know, and, and doing that kind of guided reading. And at the time we were like, Doug Fisher's a little crazy. Like, mm-hmm. of course we do guided reading. <laughs> um, and that's just a memory that's has stuck out to me for, for a long time, especially as that actually started to come to fruition. And I was like, yeah. Doug Fisher was right. Uh, <laughs> sometimes, yes. Sometimes, sometimes. sometimes you have a lot of experience and you start to say, you know what? We gave this a try. It was logical and it's not working. So we need to stop. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's the sign of a profession is when you're willing to say the best evidence we have right now directs us in this way. And as we acquire more evidence, we are responsible for making changes in our practice. And I think that's the, that's the hope um, as literacy professionals and, and the hope that when we say things like science of reading, which is a phrase that's been around a long time, when we say that, we really mean it, that we mean we are taking knowledge and we're continuing to learn because we have a goal, a shared goal that young that children across their lifespan learn to read, that every single brain is taught to read this, this very complex, very nuanced process of, I can read, I can make sense of the, the information in a text and I can use it. I, I can do meaningful things with what I've read. Which is yeah, the, that's the goal. <laughs> that's actually that's a perfect segue into what we're talking about today. So we know the ultimate goal of reading is comprehension, and we've been doing a podcast series on the different parts of the reading rope and exploring how these parts lead to comprehension. But we're going to bring it all together today, and we're going to think about comprehension as the outcome of all of those parts. So I'd I'd love to hear your thoughts on the this or react to this, that comprehension is an outcome, not necessarily a skill to practice. What's your take? I think that's something that we kind of recognize these days is that, that the goal is to understand, to do things. So I would even say my thinking has evolved a bit more than that and saying the point of comprehension is not just comprehension. It's to do things that matter with the information you've gained. 
So we used to think of mm-hmm. comprehension as like a strategy or a process. And uh, I think we have multiple meanings to the word comprehension. Uh, and I'd like to push a little bit on when, when, whether you're five years old or 15 years old or 35 years old, when you read something and you understand it, what are you going to do with this? Is it, you know, to, to talk to other people about it is to use it in an argument you have, is it for entertainment? So what is it? What's the point of comprehension? What do we want to gain out of that? And I just saw another article in the reading teacher, David Pearson and colleagues wrote about, uh, how do we use the knowledge we've gained from text into to do meaningful things. We, Nancy and I say, take action in the world. What do you want to do with this? <clears throat> and I, I've been saying that the point of reading is not passive consumerism. And, and I think that many of us were taught, you know, that you read to consume. And I think that's only part of it. I think you also read to produce, whether that's writing or a partner conversation or like, I belong to book clubs. The reason I go to book clubs is I want to talk about what I'm reading with other people. And so if I don't understand it, if I don't make sense of it, I really can't go do the thing that I care about, which is to talk with the other people about what we read. I have, uh, my mother loves to read the news, uh, but I think she only likes to read the news to tell her children about what's in the news. (laughs) And she loves to tell us what's in the news. And, and, you know, at some point you're like, yeah, mom, I read that, or I actually don't care about that, whatever. But but p- the point of consuming that information is to know things about the world today and to talk to her kids about the world today and the things that are going on in the world. Yeah, I I totally resonate with that. I get obsessive about s- topics and then do like a deep dive into them. <laughs> and it's <clears throat> it's just like, I don't know if it's endearing or not to everyone, but... <laughs> It's definitely fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we thought it might be fun to explore how like each part of of the of really leading up to comprehension connects to it and, and really impacts it. So I'm going to turn it over to Melissa to uh, to ask you the first question. So I think I want to come back to that idea of doing something with reading, but we'll come back. To I that do. For <laughs> at sure. the end or doing something with what you read and comprehended. Mm -hmm. But we'll bring we're going to bring it back to the beginning first. So all summer, we've had this series where we've been looking at, um, you know, how how the science of reading is beyond just phonics, right, that there is Mm -hmm. research to support many different things that go into reading. But we do want to take a minute to talk about if the ultimate goal is well, now you changed our ultimate goal. (laughs) But if the step before your ultimate goal is comprehending what you've read, then Let's go back to phonics and phonemic awareness. How sure. does that set a stage? And how does, like, why do we need to make sure that that is actually solid for students so that we get to that ultimate goal? So <clears throat> I guess I think about um, those, those foundational skills as serving the foundation that when your brain starts to move to automaticity with those, you free up the memory, the working memory to do other things. So if I spend all my energy trying to ascribe uh, and blend and, 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 and blend through, you know, that, that's where my energy is. And I, I can't get to the deeper understanding or meaning and my fluency gets compromised. And I may not even know what the words mean. I am pretty good at reading in Spanish, but I don't always know what I'm reading. But I don't have a problem telling my friends what the words say because I understand the rules. Now, as, mm. as without understanding the rules, I couldn't do anything, but I understand how it works and I can read most anything in Spanish and say it correctly, but I don't always know what I'm reading because I also need vocabulary, concept knowledge. I need to read fast enough that I can remember what I just read. And I read really slowly in Spanish. And often I'm super happy when I encounter like, a word that I know, because then I can read that faster. And or uh, uh, at sight. And, and I like the, the, the comment, the joke that's been made that all words aspire to be sight words when they grow up. And, um, <laughs> it's a fun one. I mean, that's, that's how it is a fun one. Um, I think that these are foundational skills. And the reason we called them foundational, is we didn't call them optional. We call them foundational 
because you got to go through this process and automate them and get faster at them and, and, and recognize them. And we don't want to leave readers there, but it's not wise to jump ahead of it and say, Oh, they don't need to know this. And here are the things we need to develop the students. I think that the, the more interesting conversations around that are the scope and sequence, how they develop. Unfortunately, I'm still seeing, you know, letter of the week stuff. Now I thought we already knew that, that we don't, spend a whole week on a letter, but I'm still seeing some places where it's, you know, 26 weeks to learn your letters. That's going to place you at risk. And what, um, like, at what level do you see that, Doug? Is that ki- kindergarten? Yeah, I'm still seeing TK, what we call transitional kindergarten and kindergarten letter of the week. And I mean, there's plenty of evidence in alphabetics that that's not really necessary. I, I still have classrooms that I see that we're teaching alphabetic like a the first week b the first next week c oh, wow. Oh, wow 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 i mean jinx <laughs> and and i think these are well meaning well intended teachers who um who just don't yet know right. there's other ways to do this uh, and the expectation that it takes 26 weeks to learn your letters can you implies, give us quick... yeah. oh, sorry I was just going to say, can you give a quick, like, what what should we be doing in case someone well, listening doesn't know? <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess the best evidence is around a, 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 at least a day uh, or more letters. Some letters don't require an entire day uh, and that we should be cycling through them. And we should be going to, you know, through through letter recognition, what the, you know, the sounds of the letters, the blends of those letters. And we're cycling through them. Um, and then like Ray Reitzel has done, studied a lot about what is the right way to teach alphabetics. And, you know, he's got these six conditions of, and it's not alphabetic order. It's, you know, with frequency, it's with the letters and your names of the kids in the class. I mean, he's got this mm. whole system of, of here's how letters develop. It, it, letter recognition knowledge develops alphabetics. Um, so Nancy Fry and I have a project, an early childhood project in the Republic of Georgia, the country of Georgia. Their graphemes are, they're very different from ours. Um, and, and that I don't recognize them. So I am starting to learn that the letters, cause I spend enough time there and it takes a while because the formation looks different from what I learned. And so I, I I'm not going to be able to do much else if I don't know what the letters of the alphabet are. Um, I see signs all around when I go to Georgia, I, I can't read any of them <laughs> because I don't know the letters yet. As I start to learn them, I'm starting to recognize certain words. Oh, that means this. That means this. And so, again, I'll leave it. It's important. Uh, it's foundational. And we called it that for a reason. Yeah, good point. I like that. Um, there, I mean, there are separate strands in the standards too, right? And they're meant to be taught till mastery. And you're right. They're foundational for a reason. They're meant to be taught to, to quote, mastery, um, which differ kind of into the other pieces that we're going to talk about, which I'd love to dive into vocabulary and think about the connection between vocabulary and comprehension. Um, And I'd also love to hear your thoughts on, you know, can you teach vocabulary to mastery? And what does that mean? We get, we get so many vocabulary questions on this podcast. (laughs) Oh, I bet. Um, Well, vocabulary is a significant predictor to whether or not you understand what you read. Um, and people recognize that the problem is there's so many words you'd have to teach hundreds of words a day. Right. Uh, thankfully, some of the words we learn, we, we learn from listening to other people, talking to other people and reading things, which we're lucky on that. So our vocabulary grows. It depends on the kinds of words that students need, um, and the words that we're teaching for them. Uh, I guess we're at the point of being able to say, we don't actually wor- learn words in isolation. We learn concepts and vocabulary, the labels for those concepts. I think that's probably why knowledge is so popular right now to talk about in the world of reading is, do you have enough knowledge to make sense of this? And what does the teacher need to do to build or activate that knowledge and the experiences you have? Um, and, And the vocabulary becomes like, oh, here is the label for this concept. By the way, when you go that direction, here's you have a concept, here's a label for it. It's way easier to remember. It's way easier to then use. We have to have students producing language, whether that's in writing or in speaking, they need to produce the language and not just listen to the language. So having a teacher use a lot of academic vocabulary 
is helpful as an apprentice, but to get to learn it, you got to produce it yourself. And so there's a lot that goes on into like word solving strategies, direct instruction, and then getting students to use the words. Selecting words is super important. We tend to see some rare words and interesting, you know, like unique words being taught rather than a balance of utility words and multiple meaning words, polysemous words. Uh, I was in a school, happened to be a school uh, for students who are deaf, and they were looking at the word train. And the sign for train on like a train on a train track is different than the sign for train, like train your dog or train a dragon. And they were going back and forth with what does the word mean? If you don't have a concept for it, it doesn't actually matter what the label is because you don't understand it. So the teacher had to work on the concept of train, choo-choo train, versus train your body, train your dog, train your dragon, you know, train for an X, train for a marathon. And so <clears throat> they're playing with this word, and it's a fairly simple word, but it has these meanings to it that are impacting whether or not you understand what you read. The evidence suggests that students activate all known definitions of a word simultaneously. And then they use what their knowledge, their context, et cetera, to predict the meaning. So if you only know one meaning of the word train, your brain's probably going to use it. And it's not going to make any sense because it, why would we be talking about a train that has passengers on it when you're talking about a dog? It doesn't, you know, so it, it, we have to help students develop those more robust and depth of meaning of words. Yeah, that just reminded me of when I was in school and we had those vocabulary books and you just memorize, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> here's a list of 10 words, 20 words, you memorize the definition. I don't even know that I knew what I was just spitting back out the definition that I memorized. I probably had no concept of what those words actually meant. <laughs> Some of them I might, I may have, but you know, others I just was trying to pass the test on Friday. <laughs> mm -hmm. My mom produces these random papers of my sister and I to this day. I don't, I, I you think I she'd run it. out by now, but <laughs> she does. And she produced a couple months ago, uh, a thing where, uh, apparently I had to write my vocabulary words 25 times. And it is oh so gosh. obvious that I'm writing letter by letter, not the whole uh. word. And, uh, because <laughs> the, the, the handwriting changes, like all the T's are the same, right? Uh, and, but it, it's clear it's not a connected word. And so I'm going through a motion, probably useless, maybe in, for letter formation, but I was way older than that. But, you know, there I am. And my mom produces this random piece of work. And she said, look at what I found. And because <laughs> she does that every couple of weeks. And, um, <laughs> and, I, and I really, I, I, I mean, I was allowed to do that. And, you know, thankfully I learned to read, but, you know, it probably didn't help my vocabulary at the time to write the word 25 times in letter at a time, you know, all the T's in a row and whatever else is next. <laughs> yeah, definitely don't do that. <laughs> yeah, <teaching>. right. <laughs> but again, a well-meaning, well-intended teacher who gave me practice. Right. But do you think that it, you would know it anymore if you had actually written out the whole word? Well, I, not help me with vocabulary, but sight recognition probably would have, you know, there's a pattern of repeating it over and over again. I don't think I learned much from the way I did it. And that wasn't my teacher's fault. That's how I did the practice. So uh, just a quick question about, so you mentioned, I mean, you know, there's unlimited vocabulary words and yeah. um, it, uh, that always for me as a teacher was a little bit daunting. Like, am I picking the right words to teach them? And, mm -hmm. and is it, I, I, I can't remember numbers, but I feel like I remember seeing at some point, like, I don't know how many, like 5,000 words a year or something like that, mm -hmm. that kids yeah. need to learn. And I'm like, well, I can, I don't have enough time to teach 5,000 <laughs> words. Right. Uh, right. I, I mean, what, what how do you, what, what do you say to teachers? Like, how do we even start to tackle this? So the, the, the studies on vocabulary knowledge volume uh, are a bit dated, but I don't have any better sources, but the estimates about 88,500 word families by the time you get to ninth grade. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so if you take 88,500 and divide by nine years of school, 180 days, it's impossible. So thankfully they show up at school with some vocabulary knowledge. They already know right. some things, um, probably higher levels of oral vocabulary than written vocabulary, print vocabulary. Um, but they know stuff about the world and they have concepts and labels for those concepts. Then a, a, a chunk of words we learn from our interactions with other people and with text. But there are certain kinds of words that we don't learn as well in those ways. And we probably need 
word solving strategies and then direct instruction on some words. So the way I think about this is, if, let's talk about text-based vocabulary. If I look at a piece of text and the author has planned with context clues or the words have parts, morphology, that have been previously taught and learned, I should show students how to solve for unknown words. If that's not possible and the word is important, if it's a one-time word and you don't need it ever again, I'm going to tell you what it means or we're going to move on. But if it's going to be an important word, then I probably need to move into direct instruction. But again, if the author, if the piece of text has high levels of context or familiar morphology, then I'm going to focus on word solving. And as teachers, we have to decide, is this a time to teach students how to figure out unknown words using resources, or is this a direct instruction word? Or is this word not that important and I should just tell them what it means and move on? <laughs> Because as yeah. you said, we're going to run out of time. That's such a good point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I always think about when, I, even when I'm reading to my four-year-old, I'm like, think, I'm like, I can't stop and tell them what all these words mean all the time. But we, we read books over and over. So sometimes we stop and talk about some things and mm-hmm. other times we just keep it moving. Yeah. <laughs> Doug, you mentioned the uh, idea of, you know, saying, using vocabulary words in oral language and everyday language. Um, I'm wondering if, we could explore that idea between comprehension and oral language and speaking, um, and then eventually head into writing. When we look at the oral language, you know, the, uh, there's an old quote James Written said, reading and writing float on a sea of talk. Um, and I think that we miss that, you know, that listening comprehension is important. And if you look back, there have been studies about, you know, your listening comprehension is essentially sets a ceiling for your reading comprehension. Okay. There's variations in people. Some, some will argue with that, but your listening comprehension has to be strong enough. And when kids come to us early, their listening comprehension is way higher than their reading comprehension when they're five years old. And if we don't continue to stress their listening comprehension, are we building their world knowledge, their vocabulary knowledge, their speaking and listening vocabularies so that the reading starts to catch up? Now, when I say that, I want to be careful that we don't just make, you know, the early years all oral um, because print is super important. But I think there's times to read a more complex piece of text and discuss it and stretch some listening comprehension and then develop those skills. And as kids get older and older, that oral, that the listening comprehension and reading comprehension get closer and closer together. And then we need to be pushing that. I start to think about like when you get to fourth grade and how do we push enough that, that the reading stays high um, that you know, people talk about the fourth grade slump and there's all mm-hmm. kinds of theories about why that occurs. And is it the transition to more information? You know, there's all kinds of people, you know, talking about this and we don't really have a solid answer on it, but could it also be that we haven't spent enough time on growing listening comprehension while reading comprehension is growing? Uh, in that speaking and listening brain. And it's not, it's, it, it, it's not as simple as saying, you know, I'm going to have you talk to your partner. It's, it's active listening. It's processing and asking related questions and coming back around to it. And, and it, essentially you're developing some of the verbal reasoning skills uh, that happen verbally first before they occur through print. And some people talk about like verbal reasoning includes inferencing and backwards and forwards inferencing and, and the ways in which the writers use figurative language and metaphorical kinds of things. So there's a lot that goes into that verbal reasoning and it's the thinking through um, and using what you know, what's happening in the text to make these logical inferences about what's happening. <clears throat> and uh, um, like, like we said, we can't teach all the vocabulary. The writer can't tell us everything. There has to be some <laughs> amount of, I'm going to imply this, you're going to infer it. You know, the writer implies, the reader infers, and, and that we're thinking through. I have this image in my mind of, I don't even know where I saw this years ago. Maybe it was in a book you wrote. Who knows? Um, there's the leveling out of <laughs> listening comprehension to silent reading comprehension. Does that happen? Like you mentioned fourth grade. I thought that I had read it was sixth grade. Mm-hmm. Not that it actually matters, but I'm just curious. Do you have a, do you, mm-hmm. do you have like a time? <laughs> uh, so uh, 
Yeah. So um, I think that's the strict study. I think it's 1984 and it was uh, included in the common core standards in the appendix. And it shows like, here's your listening comprehension. And they start to go like this and um, you'll see the gap closure. Uh, and it gets almost, it, almost the same in grade eight, but it's super close in grade six. Uh, and then the worry on that is if your if your line is going up with listening comprehension, but you don't teach listening comprehension and you flatten the line, let's say you flatten the line in grade three and there's no more listening comprehension and it's flattened. Can reading ever go above that? That's the debate that we're having right now about, about oral language and listening comprehension is if we stop some stretching, and I think there's some natural development in this and there's some intentional instruction required. Uh, but if we don't push listening comprehension, let's say it fades off at grade three or four or something, and let's say it ends at this flat level, can reading ever go higher than that? And that's the kind of the question that we have about what role should oral language and listening comprehension play in the teaching of reading? Yeah, that's actually, I was going to ask you um, about read alouds. You know, I think I've, I've heard that debate all the time, especially that third through sixth grade band always is like, do we keep reading aloud to students? Is it, you know, when do we stop reading aloud? And I think today we would say it's more, we would call it more of an interactive read aloud. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not simply listening to your teacher read. That's a good it's, point. It's an, an interaction we have as the teacher reads. And probably the reading is more complex than students can do on their own. And we're having some conversation about it. And it should not eclipse the other forms of reading instruction that are occurring, but should serve to complement in these doses of students having to process bigger ideas than they may be able to do on their own. Um, so I think more of an interactive read aloud would be where I would go with this right now and trying to build that, um, that verbal reasoning, like I'm hearing this, I'm processing it. Here are the bigger things that my teacher wants us to talk about with my partner, with the whole class back and forth. Um, so I, I think there's a role for it. I think there's a place for it. Here's my worry as you, as you say this. So lots of instructional materials come with audio recordings and they were originally designed for kids who struggle with reading. Mm -hmm. What I'm seeing a lot now is that the whole class is listening to the digital recording and not their teacher. And I understand, you know, we all get tired and things like that, but there's that passion that we bring as the reader that is hard on the digital recording. And so I think there's a, a you know, like a, I'm reading, I'm reading with expression and animation. And then I pause and say, okay, what is going on here? Let's, what just happened? And turn to your partner because we have to unpack this. This is some, this is some confusing stuff that just happened. The, the dynamism that a teacher can bring in that based on my relationship with the students and the energy that I have is a different dynamic than listening to it on a digital recording. Yeah. Um, and so I think we've overused the digital recordings that were designed for support for some students. And now they've become the, I'm going to turn on the recording and let the students listen. And the idea is these are professional readers and I appreciate the fluency model. Um, Yet I worry that the dynamism, the passion, the, the, the way that your teacher who you adore reads to you is compromised. I agree with that 100%. And I think, too, it's such a small thing. But if you want to stop and ask a question, because, you know, as you're reading, you're like, oh, what does this word mean? Let's talk about it. It's it's just so unnatural to go, look, wait, 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 we have to pause. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm going to back it up a little bit so you can hear it again. <laughs> yeah, it's just so much more natural when you're just having a, you're yeah. there having a conversation as the yeah. teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I, I have such fond memories of reading aloud to students <laughs> um, and having that. Yeah, with, with the class. I was going to flash back to fourth grade and the books that Nancy and I were reading, this group of fourth graders, and that, that, like we read a series of books and all of a sudden they're like, this one kid, Tina, said, is this dog going to die too? You keep reading us books where the dogs die. Like, I have been reading dead dog books. Like that's like a genre, I guess. For, it is for, definitely for like older elementary, I feel like. This. Right. There's a whole collection of dead dog books, right? And so I'm like, oh, I better trade this out because this dog's going to die too. So um, 
So, but I mean, when they're when they're comprehending and they're starting to make these predictions and they're inferencing and and that's a simple one. I don't mean to suggest that that, that was a complex inference, but just the idea that my brain is right there with my teacher and my brain mm-hmm. is processing this information. That is so funny. Yeah. It makes me think of a book I was reading with my daughter and she was like, I can't read this one anymore. We can't read it. Any- We're done. We're stopping here. And I was like, why? She's like, I know the dog's going to die. I just know it. And I'm not reading anymore. I was like, uh, fine. I guess we'll come back to it like in a year from now, if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> when you're ready, I don't know. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah. So let's let's dive in. Let's shift from. I I think like a lot about the the oral language as, uh, I mean, talking about what you're reading as um, like a rehearsal for writing. And I'm wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit about writing and probably extend what I said mm-hmm. in in several different ways. But um, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah. Um- people talk about writing as the flip side of the reading coin. And I think there's a relationship between reading and writing. Um, my colleagues, Steve Graham and Karen Harris and others have talked about is, are we devoting enough time to teaching writing versus assigning writing? And when we're really teaching writing, teaching, composing and encoding, it's reinforcing the reading skills that our students do. They're also writing is helpful in, you know, looking at data formatively, it's diagnostic. You know, if I look at mm-hmm. what my students are encoding, spelling, it helps me know what patterns they have under control and what they don't have under control. Uh, and what's the temporary spellings that they're having that tell me they're not understanding certain patterns and they're probably going to have a struggle with them when they end up reading them. But the writing, you know, it, writing is thinking. It, it, when you are writing, you can't do anything else but think. And so when, when we're seeing students writing, we're seeing their thinking. So writing in response to what you're reading, writing from sources, writing about what you're reading, writing about your own thinking, I, I, all of that is helpful. And it helps us think about how, and virtually every writer can read, but not every reader can write. And so I think there's a dosage of writing instruction that we need, and we should be considering the ways in which writing in influence reading and the skills that we all want to combine together, that we want to weave together, bond together to create strong readers. I have a really random question, but when I was student teaching, they actually had a reading teacher and then a writing teacher and kids would go from one to the next. And I, as I've gotten older, I've just been like, that just seems kind of silly to me. Yeah. <laughs> what are your thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> I, I worked at a high school that had that, uh, that they had decided to divide reading and writing. And so there was not a lot of connection in the writing class to what we were reading. So as but a it, person doing literature and reading, I was still having them write because how will I know if they're understanding? So right. I don't know what the writing teacher was having them do. I think we should be very careful about that. I would rather have double the time with my students and be reading and writing. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's, I think when we separate. That's exactly what we said. This <laughs> I know, we were just talking about that. We, yep. we had that conversation yep. this morning. <laughs> but we don't devote enough time to writing, and that's probably why schools have divided it, is because they can ensure the students are actually getting some writing instruction. Mm-hmm. Um, because we all know, read, I, could, I could teach reading for the entire school day. I know there are other things that are super important. They have to learn mathematical thinking. They have to learn content. I mean, there's evidence that's starting to say, We should have more content learning like science and social studies to improve reading scores. Mm -hmm. Um, In fact, the study that just came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, So because content knowledge makes a difference and background knowledge or or knowledge in general makes a difference in reading. So um, so I do think that more systematic in terms of writing, uh, in terms of writing instruction is going to be useful. Uh, I mean, we've got evidence on things like interactive writing across the grade levels where you share the pen and you compose together and they get to see the speech to print connection. The teacher is talking, you know, spelling patterns, organization, you know, capitalization space, whatever it is that they're working on as a class. And I've, I taught ninth graders interactive writing and they shared the pen and they came up to the dry erase board and we composed sentences together so they could see how their ideas could get translated into print. I, I love the idea of interactive writing. <laughs> I do too. Uh, 
makes me want to do it with some students. <laughs> um, I'm going to bring us back to, we started the conversation around comprehension being more of an outcome, but you've mentioned a few things along the way of, you know, inferences, verbal reasoning, some, you know, we, we talked about it more in the oral language, but I'm wondering mm -hmm. in written language too, are there, even though comprehension is the outcome and so many things play a part in getting to the place where you understand what you've read. Are there specific things we need to also teach students about how to comprehend a text? And this is, these are things that come up that we, we have to show you how to get through them. Yeah. And I think there's, there's evidence on comprehension strategy instruction. Um, although it's not the, so, I mean, we, we go through these phases in reading about like what we pay attention to and we got way too deeply into, you know, these strategies that work kinds of like, this is the comprehension. You cannot predict your way through a text you cannot read. It doesn't, you know, you can't do that. Um, however, when those other forces have mobilized, you probably are creating images in your mind. You're probably monitoring whether or not you're understanding what you're reading. You're probably synthesizing or summarizing information as you read so you can remember things. And those are things we can practice. And there's evidence that we can teach students to do this and, and improve their ability to have strategies uh, for comprehension. The question is, for what purpose? To what end? Why would I want to do this? And motivation, engagement, all those things. Like, what's the reason that I'm reading this? What am I going to do with it? So we talk about what does a text inspire you to do? Like at the end of a, of a really, you know, like if we're really into a piece of text at the end of it, what are you inspired to do based on this text? And, and, and maybe different students have different ideas of what they're inspired to do. And maybe some want to write and some want to make presentations and some want to have a debate. But are there times where we can open the door a bit and allow students to be inspired based on what they're reading versus we only can have one assignment to demonstrate your understanding. Okay. So I would love to think about being really practical and thinking about how teachers can apply what we talked about today in their classrooms. So I would love to hear your top three recommendations uh, based on what we discussed today. Like what would you say to a teacher who's looking to implement something in their classroom tomorrow? I think we've underappreciated the role of knowledge and building knowledge that includes labels for that. And that occurs across grade levels. We, we have to build knowledge with students uh, and the labels for that knowledge. Uh, I also, second, I would say we have to recognize, understand that all of these components of reading literacy get woven together. And we, we need to, to be developing all of them. I mean, we should be thinking about uh, verbal reasoning with kindergartners. We should be thinking about fluency as they learn to, to recognize the words and start to see patterns. All of that gets woven together. And we have to make sure. So I have to be careful with this because different grade levels have different areas of emphasis and focus. But, but they're woven together. And in meaningful ways that help students say, I'm getting it now. I'm, I'm feeling good about this. I, I want students to experience success with reading. I want students to say, this is cool. I'm getting information. This is interesting. Um, rather than saying, this is drudgery, it's painful, and I hate doing this. I, I, I want students to have some joy and some experience with reading. Um, and I want them to see if there's a utility to it. We read things to find things out that help us be better at something. And then third, um, I probably would say we, um, we have to figure out what we mean by comprehension and is the goal of comprehension really comprehension? Can we get to the point where students do meaningful things, things they care about with what they've read? I love that you pushed us to a next step because we started with <laughs> comprehension is the goal. So I really appreciate that you pushed our thinking on that today. Of course. So we'd love to ask you four rapid fire questions about some things that you love. Okay. Can you just share the first thing that comes to your mind? No pressure. Are you ready? Oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. Okay. I have, I have the first question. What do you love to read? 
Uh, right. I, I still love to read adolescent fiction. I think the world of adolescence is so cool and interesting too. And what they're reading and, it, you know, because it reflects our society and because the, the adolescent fiction literature changes so much year to year. I agree. <laughs> I haven't read a lot in a while, though. I need to I need to see what's what's popular mm. now. <laughs> All right. What do you love to watch? What do I love to watch? Um, I like longer movies. Um, I'm not that great. I'm not that great in um, series because I get bored in a, you know, series, you know, like I have to watch nine episodes of it. So I would prefer to watch a longer movie. And I do like to know what's current in the world of movies because my friends and family all talk about movies. Uh, so I, I go to, I, I like to go to movies and I like to see longer. I, I'd rather spend two hours or two and a half hours watching something and not parse it apart into like 40 minutes here, 40 minutes here, 40 minutes here. So funny. I'm the exact opposite. Oh yeah. I don't know why, but I can't sit through a movie, but I could sit through out, like episode after episode after episode. Binge watching. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> I know. I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, I love that it's the total opposite of how I approach it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ne- next question. What do you love to listen to? Oh, I'm still into 80s alternative music. Um, I really like 80s alternative but if you're in my car, it would be uh, the the Sirius Radio Channel Two, whatever's current, because I want to know what um, the current songs are that people are that like my students are talking about, that people in the world are talking about. So I don't want to be left behind. So when you go to like the club, you know exactly what to do. You're like, I got these songs, I can dance, so, I can right. sing. Yes, exactly, <laughs> totally. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> you got it. All right, our last question is why do you do what you love for education? Uh, you know, I don't I just love watching the learning process. I love watching whatever age they are. I've taught so many different grade levels uh, up through college. Learning is so cool. It's so much fun. Um and I think I was socialized as a, as a kid that you want to do something that matters in the world. You want to do something that you help other people. And uh, I came from a library assistant. My mother was the assistant in the library at my elementary school. And so when I got in trouble, uh, which did happen more often than I'd like to admit, um, I got sent to the library to my mom. I didn't get sent to the principal. (laughs) And my mom was busy working as the assistant in the library. And she'd say, go get a book and read in the corner. And so I I think a huge part of why literacy uh, made a difference for me is because it was safe. It was when I was in trouble. uh, It was with my mom. And so it was natural to move into helping other people, um, young people, learn to care about reading and and the, the worlds that they can visit because of their reading. I feel like what I'm taking away from this podcast is that we should meet your mom. Oh, <laughs> yes, she, <should. laughs> she sounds mom, like a wonderful she, person. <laughs> she's a very fun, very happy person who really loves life. Yes. <laughs> she can just give us the news breakdown. Doug's mom on then... a future episode. <laughs> yeah, That's right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much. I was just going to ask if there was anything you wanted to share with the audience, if there's a new book coming out or anything that you wanted to <laughs> Make sure they um, check I out. I would say this. I would say this. I, I think we're not taking enough credit for what we do. We tend to, as teachers, give credit to everyone else. And yeah, families are important. Our colleagues are important. But you know what? We're having an impact on our learners. And I, I wish we'd take a little credit for it because we're working really hard and we're doing great things. I know the media is beating us up. The, sometimes families are beating us up. Um, sometimes families are loving us and appreciating us, but it's a hard job and it didn't get any easier in the last two years. Um, and we need to take some credit because we are making a difference. We are seeing progress with our students and they desperately need us. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on our show today and sharing all of this amazing information. We really appreciate your time. Oh, thank you. And everything that you do. We really appreciate it.
Thank you. Enjoyed the conversation with the two of you. I look forward to seeing you again at an upcoming one of our events where we all get together <laughs> and we get to talk about the amazing world of teaching reading. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks for listening, literacy lovers. To stay connected with us, sign up for our email list at literacypodcast.com. And to keep learning together, join the Melissa and Lori Love Literacy Podcast Facebook group and be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter. If this episode resonated with you, take a moment to share with a teacher friend or leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Just a quick reminder that the views and opinions expressed by the hosts and guests of the Melissa and Lori Love Literacy Podcast are not necessarily the opinions of Great Minds, PBC, or its employees. We appreciate you so much, and we're so glad you're here to learn with us.